Thank you for coming. Beautiful Sunday day. The avant-garde is currently much maligned and misunderstood. Treated overwhelmingly as a historical category by conservatives, postmodernists, and revolutionaries alike in the wake of the original avant-garde, its continuing dynamism and critical content has been either denied or foreshortened. Indeed, in Europe and North America, in the 1980s and 1990s, down to the proto avantgardism of Jacques Rancière and the Reine Madieu today, today, it has suffered from caricature or enfeeblement. Too often politics step in to save the art, or art steps in to diffuse the politics, leaving the art and the politics separate. But far from the avant garde disappearing as an active possibility, artists is destruction by the combining counter revolutionary forces of fascism. And Stalinism at the end of the 1930s, it has remained a compelling form of attraction for artists since 1945, and as such, an unyielding source of artistic readaptation and re theorization. This is because the avant garde and its revolutionary forms produced a profound shift in artists' expectations that coincided with the demise of traditional bourgeois relations and practices and bourgeois modes of aesthetic judgment during this period. In attacking the academy, the artistical modes of artistic practice, focused principally on painting and freestanding sculpture, art liberated itself from the constraints of craft specificity in order to place itself within the advanced technical relations of the epoch, photography, film, mass production itself. This required fundamental epistemological and cultural realization of arts and modes of production, the reception, and the identity of the artist. The category of art was no longer embedded in delimited notions of artistical artisticness and authorship, painting or sculptural expression, but in the transmaterial and post-disciplinary realm of thought experiment. The fundamental shift initiated by modernism then was less the move to paint the abstraction than the subsumption of art under the logic of art's conceptual and formal conjunction, the conjunction of the conceptual and formal. In other words, art embraced general social technique as the necessary means by which art's opening up to autonomy was to be sustained against its reduction to tradition and academic precedence. In these terms, painting could no longer act as a supreme art of value, given that for art to advance and make sense of its historical conditions of emergence, it had to break with its own entire conditions of conceptualization. This is why the attempt to think art solely through painting in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War produces its own invasions and simply disorders, because whichever way the open syntax of painting might be defended, the openness of this syntax itself is undetermined, that is, it has no concrete purchase as social technique, and as such, has an attenuated relationship to the extra artistic wheel. This is why, although painters continue to paint, it's impossible to imagine an advanced journal of painting today. Whatever tales of formal complexity might be spun from painting's recent histories, it cannot have any heteronymous purchase on the extra artistic. All it can provide structurally is melancholic allure in which the debilitated zones of personal creativity are offered as a resistance to theory and a resistance to political praxis. 
Even those painterly practices that have themselves resisted this option, such as Gerhard Richter, have themselves caught up in this dilemma to continue the historical continuum of painting by other means. Hence, in the years 1915 to 1939, art looks in two directions simultaneously in order to escape the dismal prospects of a vacuous personal creativity or melancholic staging of painting's own endgame. Inwardly, there is a return to the studio as a renaissance type studiola, as an intellectual study, and outwardly, an attachment to the artist as technician and operator, in which the making of meaning is identifiable with the execution of art as a concept, as a speculative discourse on art's multiple formal and cognitive possibilities. The artist, as a result, takes it as given that freeing the artist's expressive hand from this process is the best means of sustaining this process of conceptualization. The question of art's conceptualization, then, is less a localized stylistic phenomenon than an ontological priority of the modern division of labor, and as such, indivisible from the supersession of art's traditional mimetic and motor expressive functions. This is why in the epoch of art's traditional demise, this process of conceptualization is, in, is inescapably Hegelian. It defines of all the feeble and anti-historical diatribes against the erosion of artistic skill and value. In defining the end of art's traditional mimetic function as the end of art, Hegel opens out a space in which the possibilities and limits of art can be articulated and defended as a necessary task of modernity. As such, the recurring elite, isolated humanist histories of art in the 20th century, bourgeois and leftist alike, increasingly revived today, despite what um, I think it was saying, uh, do violence to the post-classical, post-traditional, and ultimately post-art condition of art, rendering incomprehensible its extended conceptualization. In the intangibilities of form, skill and de-skilling in art after the Renoume, I explore this fundamental historical shift, the development of a labor theory of culture, in which the relationship between skill, de-skilling, re-skilling, form a dialectical triad for understanding art's self-negating place within this intellectual and social division of labor. In this presentation, however, my concern crucially is the mediated category of the avant-garde within this dialectic. For it is precisely the avant-garde as a space of the non-identitary tasks of revolution and modernity pursued from within the technical challenges of art's post-art status that brings art's conceptual self-articulation under the emancipatory name of the end of art to self-consciousness. This is why, um, for Hegel, the end of art and conceptualization are not so strange as companions as one would initially assume. For a defense of the avant-garde is fundamentally about establishing an adequate theorization of the model. Okay, I've entitled this section the avant-garde research program. Such a history of conceptualization and the modern, therefore, promises a very different understanding of the avant-garde within this extended periodization. Given that it pulls our discussion of the avant-garde away from the over-familiar emphasis upon avant-garde movements, styles, their rise, their fall, their failure, and supersession. Consequently, uh, two questions should concern us here. Firstly, what are the premises upon which the avant-garde achieves its initial coherence and function? So that's crucial, I think, to understand what it might mean today. And secondly, in what sense and to what ends do these premises continue to have explanatory power and reach today? 
In other words, what problems and issues does the historic avant-garde set apart in the epoch of capitalist modernity that still prevail? And consequently, and more pertinently, in what sense have these problems and issues actually been extended and deepened in the, in the spirit of Hegel after the initial period of avant-garde activity? Well, the problem of art stylistic historical account, well, the problem of, 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 of stylistic historical accounts of historical avant-garde is that they divorce art from this conceptual periodization of art. Um, and therefore, the productiveness of the avant-garde is assumed to be coterminous with its condition. Sorry. Um, the productiveness of the avant-garde is coterminous with its conditions of, of, of emergence. And um, to see the avant-garde simply as a set of stylistic moments or transformations um, is to is to produce a strangely um, a morally king discourse of our avant-garde failure, as if the avant-garde was responsible for its own counter-revolutionary destruction in the 1930s. As such, the name entity, the avant-garde, is quite different, and this is a crucial point that I've been making throughout this paper, that is, the name entity, the avant-garde, is quite different from the unnamed possibilities of its core research program. This is because since its emergence, the avant-garde is precisely indivisible, precisely indivisible from its theoretical investments and transformations, and therefore from its revisions, reconstructions, and retreats. As such, this retroactive reconstruction slash production of the avant-garde is itself mediated by the avant-garde's counter-revolutionary destruction. Insofar as the avant-garde's post-Thermidorian condition in the post-war world is constitutive of its new phases of development. A sequence of breakout events and activities in which the historic avant-garde is not so much recovered but put to work again under different and delimited conditions. These different and delimited conditions then mediate and transform the avant-garde school program. So there is no historically unmediated recovery of the avant-garde. Rather, the continuing productiveness of the avant-garde derives precisely from these delimited and as much as the questions the avant-garde asks of art and the world functions in the gap between the avant-garde's post-Thermidorian conditions and its mediating national contents and its ideal universal horizons. In other words, the function of the avant-garde today is inseparable from the absences and discontinuities that it carries with it. So whatever continuing purposeless we might ascribe to its core program, this core program is necessarily constrained by the gap between its post-Thermidorian reality and its imminent prospects and ideal horizons. This Hegelian critique of the unobtainable absolute with the pursuit of the absolute is central to my understanding of the political function of the avant-garde now and shapes everything it follows. The avant-garde is essentially suspensive, is a suspensive category of capitalism, and therefore any identification of it with a premature escape into politics, an instrumental reason, irrespective of art's alignment with political praxis, and I'll come to that later, or with the end of art irrespective of art's embrace of non-artistic practices and disciplines, dissolves its non-identitary functions and ambitions. And this is what I mean following Hegel by the problem of art's premature, premature secession into non-artistic technique. 
This is a dialectical avant-garde then, rather than an expression of anti-historicist one, and as such can be seen as a variation of Henry Lakatoshi's critique of Karl Popper's falsificationist defense of scientific research programs. For Lakatoshi, the core program of any scientific research program is sustained in the light of its aporiae and hiatuses. Because it is the aporiae and hiatuses that enable the analytic link between the program and the extra scientific real to continue. According to naive or dogmatic falsificationism, science grows by the repeated overthrow of theories by the discovery of hard facts. Popper follows this rational logic, but instead of prioritizing a model of expanded rational discovery based on the discovery of such facts, he formulates scientific development as a problem of fallible critical growth. Science proceeds through the reputation of one scientific theory by a better scientific theory. This can be described then as a sophisticated falsification. Its weakness lies, as Lacaton stresses, in the fact that science does not proceed simply through a discontinuous series of reputations. Reputations at some point must be replacements and deepen our knowledge. Therefore, for Lapitosh, it is important that the perceived problems with the research program do not produce a premature refutation of its core questions. The inconsistencies, anomalies, contradictions affecting the core of the research program may continue to provide the productive materials for the renewal of the core program or other unrelated research programs, even though the core of the program is challenged or weakened. This is because the questions and outcomes of the core program may still generate worthwhile and supplementary content. Something of this applies to the core program of the Alan Dark. The questions it asks of artistic authorship, productive labor and free labor, artistic form and artistic and cultural emancipation during the Russian Revolution, may be disconnected from their original conditions of articulation and possibility, but these questions still determine the field of art inquiry. Hence, the importance of needing to lift the avant-garde out from its conventional art historical categories. In shifting the theorization of the avant-garde into an account of the avant-garde as an historically open-ended research program, and as such moving beyond limiting ourselves to discussing the avant-garde simply across stylistic and formal dividing lines, we are able to turn, in turn, sorry, to see more clearly why the avant-garde still remains an unfolding site of conflictual and productive claims on art and the extra-artistic realm. Okay, now this section is entitled Berger, after Peter Berger, the avant-garde and anti-historicity. Now, of course, it is relatively easy to formulate the continuing relevance of the avant-garde outside the history of recent practices that would exemplify the key claims of a core program. Many conservative and radical critics of the avant-garde have criticized the continuing validity of the avant-garde on these terms. Where is this anointed avant-garde as a research program you talk of? Or more circumspectly, in what way do these manifestations and reconstru reconstructions you allude to add up to anything approaching what we might reasonably call avant-garde. One can talk of conceptualization and research programs without necessarily talking of the avant-garde. One such critique is Eric Hotsborn's rejection of the avant-garde in Behind the Times, the Decline and Fall of 20th Century Avant-Garde, published in 1998. On the grounds that art today can no longer offer that heightened meeting between transgressive and exemplary individuality that the original avant-garde secured. 
and therefore we should dismiss the program of the Owl Guard as unwarrantable. The argument is well rehearsed on the left and right, and as such is fairly pernicious, inasmuch as it applies standard modernist criteria, that is exemplariness, originality, the exceptional the exceptional of the exceptionalness of a singly produced non-reproducible object to the socially negating, discursive, temporal, and collective ambitions of the avant-garde. Thus, according to this view, not only is the avant-garde held responsible for its counter-revolutionary destruction, its later neo-avant-garde manifestations are condescendingly devalued for not attaining some kind of revolutionary or novel intensity. In this respect, Hobsbawm presents an all too familiar fallacy that affects most writing on the avant-garde since the late 1960s. He assumes the success of the avant-garde, its validity and productiveness, rests on the individuated achievements of a few particular artists that can be identified with specific stylistic differences in schools, but, then, but, that no, <coughs> sorry, but that now no longer apply. I quote, the avant-garde schools since the 1960s, since pop art, are no longer in the business of revolutionizing art, but in declaring its bankruptcy. End of quote. This theoretical narrowing of the avant-garde as a failed project and lost intensities is precisely the situation that confronted Peter Berger in the 1960s in West Germany when he began to think about the avant-garde anew before writing the theory of the avant-garde in the early 70s, published in 1974 in Germany. In West Germany, in a number of post-war exhibitions, key avant-garde practitioners were stripped of their determining collective social and political context to be presented as exemplary modern masters within a continuum of pre-modern and modern painting achievement, eradicating what was politically, culturally, and cognitively distinct about the historic avant-garde, separate from modernism more generally. As he says in his defense of the theory of the avant-garde in 2010, which was published in uh, New Literary History in the American uh, Journal, and I quote, the category of rupture was eliminated, and along with it, the historical avant-garde movements. End of quote. And in the wake of May 68, such revisionism was no longer possible, spurred on by, and I quote again from this article, the impulse of hope triggered by the May 68 movement. The theory of the avant-garde claims the cultural, political, and cognitive specificity of the avant-garde as separate from modernism. But in making this crucial move, Berger renders the avant-garde's distinctiveness historically inert. And this is something that um, um, I think a lot of, a lot of theorists um, tend to do. By reducing its meaning to its conditions of production, Everything that comes after it and speaks in its name is held to be a falling away from this originary revolutionary moment. This is because whatever hope had lifted the moratorium on the avant-garde in West Germany by 1973, 74, had, like the reaction and come down in Paris itself, made the recrudescence of the revolutionary energy of the original avant-garde seem suddenly questionable. And I quote again from this article, in this situation, I transfer, without being conscious of it, utopian aspirations from a society in which they could not be realized in theory. End of quote. Okay, so this obsession, um, um, for the translator, I've moved, um, I move further down the page. Uh, this obsession with that which is no longer as that which can be no longer 
is a particular fetish of our epoch and is regularly called upon by art history and cultural theory to discipline what is held to be the unobtainable and hubristic claims of art on the extra artistic degree. This is why the most assiduous writing on the avant-garde since the 1980s has insisted on the avant-garde as an open temporal experience rather than a failed event. In response to Berger's historicism, Hobbes' Bormian type neo stalinist aborted progressivism, humanist end of art diatribes, and the melancholic afflatus of postmodernist theories, how Foster and Andrew Benjamin in the early 1990s looked to the reinvigoration of the avant garde as a heuristic space, as a way out of these dead ends. And what's neo about the new avant garde, published in 1994? Foster adopts the Freudian notion of the trader type after the this or deferred meaning in order to provide a non-linear account of art's relationship to its future's past. Far from the historic Soviet and Weimar avant-garde being destroyed without remainder by the Stalinist and fascist counter-revolution, the significance of the questions they ask continue in the after effect in their after effects as a set of resources and ideals to be refunctioned and reworked. In this sense, the avant-garde always returns, and I quote from Foster, from the future, especially after the defeat of May 68. Okay, I'm going to skip a bit here as well. Okay, so in these terms, because history remains open to the future, the future meanings of art cannot be determined in advance. The present, therefore, is fundamentally open to the risk of new praxis and meaning. The present, therefore, is fundamentally open to these new conditions. In this respect, this position is close to Adorno's admonitions in aesthetic theory against the fetishism the extent object in art history, and by extension the superiority of art theory over that of art criticism. By refusing to countenance what is before us as art, art theory doesn't so much disregard actuality in history, but rather opens up the actual and its present claims on truth and futurity to other tendencies and possibilities. As a result, there would be necessity of the present is Shattered. So there would be absence of exemplary monuments to the avant garde in the present period that might match the achievements of the past is a red herring. And invariably in the interests of business as usual. Which is not to say that the extended reconstruction of the avant garde as a research program thereby dissolves us of the responsibility of deciding on issues of quality and judgment now, allowing us to take our avant-garde fantasies for reality. I'm not saying that my defense of the avant-garde is an open-ended research program engaged with the what, where, and how of art is cognate with these conditions of precarious production as a whole. The second economy produces its own fair share of traditional and feeble dry goods. Similarly, the new electronic commons underwrites the second economy is not in and of itself progressive, as any cursory glance that the internet reveals. But nevertheless, I go to the next page. But nevertheless, there is a significant correlation that needs to be addressed. For art does not so much operate in an expanded field, to quote Rosalind Krauss from the 19th century today as in relation to a diffuse collocation of energies and strategies pulled in from a range of skills, competences, and interests across the divisions of professional and non-professional, artist and non-artist, artistic practices and non-art practices, and that functions, therefore, as a common play of exchange without recourse to the sanctions 
at the hierarchies of the official artwork. In other words, art does not just enter an expanded field, disconnected from the prevailing class relations, comprise it, but is it itself subject to these relations through the mediation of the non-artistic practices and disciplines and non-professional relations that constitute the post-medium identity of art within expanded theory. In short, there can be no deconstruction of the author and art under the auspices of the avant-garde, limited to the boundaries of the art world itself. According, I move further down again, accordingly we need to subject art expanded field to the effects of its own socially expanded form since the 1990s. This is my uh, uh, crucial point. The rise and diversification of art after art in the expanded field, so art after art in the expanded field, cannot be divorced from its place, from within this massive increase of art's second economy post, within post 1970s. <coughs> it is here, therefore, that we'll be able to extend our understanding of the dynamics of the avant garde today. Now, I'm clearly not going to be able to get through. <laughs> the majority of this paper, but I'm going to, I'm going to carry on in the same mode for a little bit, later, a little bit longer. So, there is now a vast amount of artistic production that is temporal, discursive, and post-object centered. Yeah. Yes. In which the notion of artist as technician, in the classic avant-garde sense, and that's something that we perhaps um, want to bear in mind, is identified explicitly with a whole range of non-artistic skills and activities. Scientist, ethnographer, anthropologist, archivist, teacher, engineer, activist. The short selection of these groups and collectives globally gives a sense of how deep this post-art and post-artist shift now around. Stuttgart in Russia, Chainworks, Italy, Critical Art Ensemble, the USA, Future Fathers, the USA, La Lecture, Mexico, Euro Etude, France, Park Fiction, Germany, Platform, the UK, Max Media Collective, India, Dialogue, India, Amos, Congo, Superplex, Denmark, Wochenklauser, Austria, and many, many more. Now, all have different relationships to, relationships to the legacy of the avant garde, yet all draw on this identification between the artist and non artist and the critical status of the avant garde as a research. That's what distinguishes this extension of the paradigm of art in the expanded field is something that the anti-historicist and theorists of the avant-garde, or the neo-avant-garde, such as Foster and Andrew Benjamin, could only see out of the corner of their eye in the wake of the rise of artists as technician and the programmatic use of the ready-made and non-art resources. Is this link between increasing participation of art in the expanded field, or what I call art after art in the expanded field, within this growing second economy.
Okay. Arc after arc, the expanded field therefore is shaped and split by a range of countervailing forces and tendencies that heighten the transformative potentialities of the algorithm. This in turn has refocused the revolutionary presuppositions of this legacy. That is, what is evident from this shift in the political economy of art as consequent upon the renewed crisis of political autonomy is how the legacy of neo-avant-garde stratagems today have been readapted to three of the key historic avant-garde ideals and demands. Art's place in the totalizing critique of capitalist society, the revolutionary transformation of the sensible as the outcome of the latter, and the transdisciplinary and collective production of work as a necessary means by which both of the latter might be achieved. Art now, in all its multifarious post-object and post-art post forms, is embedded not just in the extended politicization of art, but also in a fundamental, praxological, praxis-based relationship to its materials, physical or immaterial. In these terms, the the rise of the new avant-garde, or more precisely, the new space of the avant-garde, concretizes one of the fundamental premises of the core program of the historic avant-garde above all others. Now, this might be construed as being contentious. On the whole, the majority of the work that I've just um, alluded to stands in advance of what prevails as bourgeois culture, bourgeois meaning and bourgeois value. In other words, across a broad range of activities, the avant-garde again defines itself as an advance of capitalism itself. This is not to be treated as a rhetorical flag. As the home of precarity and the critique of wage labor the second economy artist's living relationship to his or her materials, theoretical context, and availability of an audience is inevitably dominated by the new proletarianization of cultural production and its material realities. Post-studio nomadism, studios are too expensive to keep, laptop surfing, it's easier to do research online, collective initiative, it's best to share resources and the, and the scrounging and gleaning of poor or second-hand materials. There's no point buying what can be found. This has produced an unprecedented sensitivity on the part of artists to how they labor and under what terms. In direct opposition to any residual modernist indulgence in the picturesque fantasies of bohemian politics. Thus, if artists on the whole remain poor, poverty here is not the existential source of artistic self-transformation. Is, uh, is that a large number of artists under these conditions, under these, under these precarious conditions, are willing to do this kind of work. Under the assumption that their, contrib their conceptual contribution to this extended division of labor has transformative effect. Um, has uh, sort of qualitative effects in, in the world. Now, um, in my conclusion to my paper, which I didn't get a chance to address, I said, um, um, I'm opposed to this. I'm opposed to transformation of artists into service providers in, in, in any shape uh, whatsoever. So, um, at one level, I'm also um, opposed to the notion of the open ended uh, avant garde research program as a space for interdisciplinarity. Because, of course, um, uh, abstract, um, cultural abstract labor operates under the name interdisciplinarity. Artists contribute their conceptual skills um, to the to the outcome of other disciplines. In that sense, they, they contribute interdisciplinary skills. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to this on the grounds that um, that the artist thereby transforms themselves 
not just into a cultural worker, but into a service worker. Um, my, my argument is that, that there's no retreat, despite this, there's no retreat for the artist back into a classical modern space. So there's no retreat um, from a space of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. However, artists have to have um, a, uh, a fully negativized or negative relationship to the transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary. So it's the job of the artist not to turn themselves into uh, a, a technical provider for a given discipline, and therefore um, subsume themselves under the, uh, the discipline of abstract thing, but, but to challenge, to subvert, to undermine, to cross the fields of, uh, of interdisciplinarity. Therefore, this is a, a, a term that I, I develop with it at the end of the, of the paper, but also uh, extensively in my book, they must have an a-disciplinary relationship with the city. Because one of the few, one of the few autonomous privileges left to artists under capitalism is their uh, ability to to cross disciplines without investing in a given um, uh, discipline profession. So they have, a, if you like, a sceptical or antidisciplinary relationship to their use of discipline. So for instance, uh, a given contemporary artist might want to borrow from uh, uh, particle physics or engineering or even, or even weaving. But under the demands, under demands of abstract labor, does not mean that, that they thereby um, seek to transform themselves into engineers, weavers, or particle physicists. So they have, um, they operate a thwart or a stance or at a distance from the discipline that they, that they, that they inhabit, and use, and can transform. And given this, um, it is it is, it is difficult um, uh, for, for this process to be fully subsumed under the pressures of, of abstract labor. So the question of autonomy and how we find autonomy in a post-Adornian sense, in a post-Adornian sense, in the way of post-art, the post-conceptualization of art more broadly, is a crucial question. Thanks a lot.